A very warm welcome to all who joined the masterclass tonight at Lancaster University. You would like to extend a very warm welcome on behalf of Lancaster University and the Lancaster University Management School. To all those who are joining, possibly you are alumni who have been at Lancaster University in the past. So we say welcome back. We hope that you will enjoy this class. Um, for everyone who is a current student, we appreciate you are on this journey um, this year, and hopefully you will find this class illuminating and helpful to, to your studies and careers. And for everyone who is a prospective student, we hope that this will give you a taster of our uh, conversations and also the, the topics that we cover at Lancaster University. So we are um, counting participants who are joining us from all over the world. We are also uh, going to be joined by the two speakers tonight, who are JP Kulwein and Wolf Schaefer. They're joining us from New York in a few minutes. So until then, let me extend a warm welcome, as I said, on behalf of Lancaster University to the master class on brand elevation and how to make brands peerless and priceless. As you will be joining us tonight, um, we ask you to please be aware of a few instructions to help us uh, run things smoothly. So please check that your uh, microphones and your video is off. Um, typically it is automatically off, but it's good to double check. Also, we invite you to ask your questions using the Q&A feature. This will allow us to draw on your questions when we come towards the end of the session and we will participate in the collective Q&A session. That is when Wolf and um, JP will be happy to address your questions. Also, we like to ask you to please obviously mute your microphones. However, you can also um, raise your hand if you wish to, um, to contribute towards the end during our Q&A. And if you have any technical details, uh, sorry, difficulties, please email um, alumni at lancaster.ac.uk. I see that we have still participants joining us, which is perfectly all right. Of course, there are a few minutes uh, for us to, uh, to cover. I would like to briefly introduce the speakers and the event. So tonight's class is on brand elevation. And I think for everyone who is uh, working in marketing management um, and possibly is interested in this from a consumer perspective, we may wonder how some brands are perceived differently. Why are some brands perceived as more prestigious or peerless? or priceless. And from a strategic point of view, what we are of course interested in is understanding how to design such brands. What is the strategy behind it? And um, Wolf Schaefer and JP Kuhlwein are experts in, in brand elevation. And JP Kuhlwein is an alumni of Lancaster University. He has completed the um, postgraduate diploma in business analytics. And it's great to welcome an alumni back to campus, even if it is in a virtual setting. To quickly introduce um, a few details about JP Kulwein, uh, he's the co-founder of Viva Brands, a consultancy that helps owners elevate their brands to make them peerless, priceless, and profitable. And he's also um, been previously the executive vice president at Frederick Fekai and Company, a prestige salon and retail hair care business. And he also was the brand director and global, global director of strategy at Procter & Gamble and was based around the globe. So drawing on all of that experience and also his roles as um, a um, a member of teaching staff at the Columbia Uni University Business School in New York, and also the Stern Business School um, in New York. We are very happy to um, have the opportunity to learn about his insights that he has published with Wolf Schaefer in the book, Brand Elevation. We would like to invite the participants um, before we start the session to participate in a poll where you can identify what is it that makes some of the brands most uh, outstanding, most desirable, most prestigious. And to do so, I'm going to um, ask my colleague, Emma, to share the poll and you can participate um, in real time. So the poll should appear on your screens. And it 
is asking you, thinking of the brands you admire the most, what do you admire them the most for? Um, and you have a few options here, and we are very excited to, to learn about what is it that makes these brands special to you. It's brilliant to see that the participants are able to vote. It's going very quickly. So we will be picking up on these results um, as JP and Wolf will be um, talking us through this masterclass. Also very interesting would be to draw on these results in our Q&A. All right, very good. Thank you very much, JP, for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing my slides, so hopefully yeah. you can. Um, oh, hello, Wolf. Brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm, I'm stopping to share my slides so you have the space for you. And thank you very much for, for delivering this masterclass. And a very warm welcome back to Lancaster University for JP, and a very warm first welcome to Wolf. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person in the rainy, foggy, cold of Lancaster. No, I'm I'm sorry. No, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful place, Wolfgang. Believe me, it had lots of wonderful lakes there. That's what rain gives you, you know. <laughs> exactly. Okay, are we going live, or are we live yes. already? You are live. Um, I'm going to mute myself right. and also hide myself. And yes, the spotlight is on you. I'm going to All start right, sharing. Oh, you need to, you would allow, need to allow me to share my screen. I, I'm going to draw on the support from, right now. Um, from Libby and the other support team who are going to make you hopefully now already. It works. Awesome. Now it works. Yep. yep Perfect. Yep, yep. Thank you. All good. All good. All right. I'll get us started while Wolfgang calls up the first slide. Um, so, Welcome and thank you everyone for having us here. Um, um, as Katarina said at the beginning, I've, I've been in uh, Lancaster uh, about, uh, well, let's say it was in the late 90s, okay? Uh, in the early 90s, sorry. Um, and uh, since then I've spent about 25 years or so in marketing after Lancaster Management School uh, uh, and also some colleges in France and Germany and in marketing mainly at Procter & Gamble, but also little premium brands that Procter & Gamble was uh, holding. Um, and uh, for the last couple of years have developed a little obsession uh, together with my friend and co-author here, Wolfgang, for what we call Uber brands. And today we're gonna to talk about that, Wolfgang. Yes, the two of us actually met um, while JP was at um, p and and we uh, we started working on on the question why PNG never really managed to be successful in the premium sector, and um, so we did an analysis, and that's how the whole thing started, and that's how our passion started and our occupation these days. Um, All right, let's do the first slide. Yes. Um, why does it not? Okay, there you go. All right, here we go. So one of the questions we had, and I was in 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 corporate strategy at that point, is you know. What do brands like the ones you see here have in common? Because even during that time of the economic crisis in which we uh, kicked off that project around 2010 or so, we saw that while brands like, let's say, Olay or Pantene, et cetera, were struggling because people were counting every penny, some of these brands, which frankly are outright luxury or are overpriced for what they are, we thought as rational, you know, brand managers like a mini or a Red Bull, you know, we're growing in that environment. So we said, you know, what, what is it to them? And we looked at a lot of um, a lot of brands, um, as you can see in the next slide from, you know, toilet paper to salt and water. In fact, we have a kind of a fable for uh, the commodities like, uh, you know, water, fire and, and salt, even in those categories you would find these elevated brands. We ended up calling them Uber brands, Uber German for above and beyond, because when we looked at them and we looked at hundreds really at the end and continue to do so, what we find they have in common is they all understand themselves as being more than a toilet paper or a handbag. They are valued by us beyond the price 
um, and their esteem beyond their size. Next slide, Wolfgang, which um, is really, you know, small. Often we consider them niche and, and that makes them special to us rather than maybe not so good because not as seen on TV. And so we developed this different framework. Over to you. Um, and that's get us to the title, uh, title brand elevation lessons in Uber branding. What we started out with um, was really seven principles that we analyzed when we did our first book and did the analysis of all these Uber brands and have refined over the time. We're not going to take you through all seven principles because what we developed in the meantime is actually an action program that focuses on three phases. And we just want to take you quickly in the hour that we have through those three phases, because that's where it's most interesting also to see what um, other brands can learn from these Uber brands and how they can they they can elevate or try to elevate themselves. Um, it's all about building prestige in a modern way. Um, it's all about elevating, not necessarily in the sense of uh, fake, um, putting yourself on a pedestal in a fake way, but really gaining a prestige these days that's a bit more substantial and less only uh, built on style and imagery as it used to be, perhaps. And as Wolfgang said, we kind of extracted from that deep study and the book, the first book, Rethinking Prestige Branding, and we made it into a how-to guide because basically people started asking us all over the place, how do you actually do it? Is there a recipe? What are the 50 steps, et cetera? And we couldn't respond to all of it. So this brand guide was uh, built or better the brand elevation guide. And it has three key elements as Wolfgang said. And the first one we call dreaming, then comes doing and daring. And the dreaming um, is, is all about having a mission that goes beyond the material and building a myth. So um, the, the background for that is very easily understood. If you look at today's world, I mean, this being an, a slightly over-dramatized visual by Andreas Gorski, but not so far from reality, at least in America in a lot of cases, but mentally in our, in our world where we are inundated with lots of stuff and things. And we've come to the realization that quality sometimes is better than quantity now that we fulfilled all our most urgent needs. And so as a, as a society, at least in the Western markets, we are shifting towards looking for something that gives us more than just more stuff, that gives us perhaps a bit more um, that, that helps us um, be more qualitatively driven, helps us um, improve our lives give us what we're missing, which these days is more often soul and dignity and grace more than um, just quantitative stuff. Um, why? And this is actually a nice, um, most of you may have heard of Barbara Kruger. She's, she's been an activist in, very much in female empowerment for a long time, but also around commercialism or consumerism and the perfect expression, she didn't mean it that way, that's really what the world has come to. We want to shop ourselves a better world. We, we, are, we want to combine our ethical evolution with our commercial um, education, basically, and build a world where there's a bit less matter and stuff that we have to worry about what we're going to do with it without polluting our world even more and perhaps more meaning. A good example for that, for a brand that has managed to do this, um, wrap its functional um, functional um, delivery or service into something that is ethically and emotionally meaningful um, is Airbnb. And we're just going to show you this quick video, um, which shows you what, what they're really talking about.
Okay, that um, I think that should survive for the for the video. You get the idea. The point is, um, and I think this is this is a good a great example how to elevate your service from a platform that's more transactional and functional into something that has cultural resonance that really talks to something that we want to achieve, namely to connect with people and places and cultures when we go travel versus just stay in the ever same generic hotel environment. Um, they, they in, and, and it gets to another point, these ideas or ideals that Uber brands um, capture don't have to have a political or socio-ecological um, uh, 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 direction. It, they can be very much focused on improving a category like travel, for instance, with, through Airbnb or others. Um, it, it is important, like when you do, that you stick to it, as uh, JP is going to explain to you. Right. So, so mission should really be part of your reason for being, the famous why, right? And it can be um, about ecologically uh, or being uh, uh, so socially responsible, etc., and being uh, engaged there. Uh, basically taking your kind of social economic uh, and societal uh, environment uh, into consideration, right? And they do mix imagination with convictions, with your beliefs, and, and, and they create nice narratives like we've seen here for Airbnb you enroll into. But what they should not be is just lip service. They should not be just a CSR program that is added on or so general, like creating world peace, saving the world, saving the environment, the climate, etc., that they are literally meaningless. And that's what's happening currently. You know, they become hygiene factors where everyone jumps on, but it really doesn't lead to anything, including it doesn't build the brand. Let's take a look at an example uh, here. <laughs> So anyway, at the, end, is, point. at the end, it is Opal, but I guess it's a good point that we interrupted the video because it could really be any brand. There's so many brands that today would assume that. In fact, I usually in class show a video by Chevrolet, which similarly uh, you know, shows women. They say, I can do, I can get through it, I can make it. And you're like, what is it? Is it always? Is it, a, you know, is it Peloton? Is it Nike? Is it Opal? Is it whatever? That's what it should not be. Um, Wolfgang will show you a very different example. Yeah, it's uh, already up on the screen, actually. It's from Nike. And while Nike necessarily wasn't born a political activist, they found always ways to take a stance for their, their claim to, to really put everything you you have into your your goal and really do it uh, and get there. Um, and they, they expanded it over time and they but they always also communicated it in a way so that they can take on political as, uh, action, uh, political issues, or like in this case, for instance, the crises in their very own way.
So ver versus the lip service that JP was talking about, um, they they actually found a way to own the message because they all, a put it in their in their in the known stance and in their known um, tonality and look and feel and and the idea of just do it or don't do it, um, but also because they've been gradually taking on issues that have bigger um, a bigger potential and bigger meaning. Um, versus for instance others like opal before that just kind of attach to something that's fashionable in this in this sense uh, diversity and inclusivity which doesn't have anything to do with what they've been dying on for so that's completely incredible uh, patagonia of course is another example where which they do they do have taken on uh, uh, um, a socio-ecological issue um, they need to save the world really um, or at least don't destroy it while you explore it but they live it. They, they from the get go, they, they, they were living it inside out in everything that they do. It was never just an outer world. They really sacrificed. And I think that's the most important thing. You need to be able and willing to sacrifice for your mission if you want to, um, uh, if you if you want to really be taken seriously. Here you see, for instance, how they how they follow the footprint and they, they, they actually even go to the extent of of discontinuing products if they feel like they're not ecologically sound anymore. They can't deliver them in the way that they, they the standards that they are used to or that they want to, wouldn't want to do. But we're going to talk about being um, credible a little bit more throughout. All right. So one of the questions we usually ask students here at this point is, what's a myth? And we might discuss that at the very end. Let's push the interaction to the end and, and get through the presentation. But, you know, my guess is that you will have said, well, it's a story, but maybe it's a little bit of a fake story, too good to be true story. Those are the typical immediate top of mind reactions. Similarly, your answer, you asked, uh, or you were asked at the beginning to, say what's luxury. Hopefully by now you start to evolve your perception of what it is versus you might have replied like, you know, precious materials, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see that at the end. What is a myth? Myths are collective dreams. Next slide. According to Joseph Campbell, who is a guy who knows a thing or two about that or who was a mythologist uh, actually who lived uh, about 500 yards from where I am right now here uh, outside New York. Um, so they are very seductive and they've survived over millennia because they're kind of about shared hopes, dreams, uh, resolving puzzles like what happens after you know you're dead or what happens at the end of the earth or the universe etc why does the, a boy love his mom they resolve some of these things and they are obviously fantastic stories what is important here is that the best way to go up in consideration next slide Wolfgang is yeah. to go deep and myths do go deep next slide um, because as stories, they give us soul, i.e. they let us feel it, they reel us in, they make us part of it, um, they make us believe, um, we want to believe, sometimes even, you know, uh, we're fighting our own logic and we say, no, we want it to be true, we're going to see a man on the moon, uh, JFK said, and finally, Congress approved that money where before all rational arguments could not get them to approve those billions back then. And stories make us talk. These are the stories up to now we're telling and retelling uh, because they're much easier to remember than facts and data. But beyond the social or psychological um, uh, um, uh, advantages of stories or potential of stories, they actually do something. And it was proven by uh, by two guys a little while ago, I think 2014 it was. Um, they actually make things seemingly more valuable to us. Because if they, they what they did is they went to, uh, to um, uh, flea markets and bought all kinds of trinkets. Um, that were not more well worth more than like a dollar or a dollar fifty maximum that they paid for it, and then they wrote to everything. They wrote a little story, wrapping it in some kind of like experience or some past kind of like happening or so that were all invented, and they put stuff online with those stories, and it garnered sometimes more than five hundred percent 
of the original value. So it was increasingly going up and the more um, emotionally involving the story was, the more people were willing to really suspend uh, their 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 rational uh, rational side and their criti critical side and really give in to the pleasure of 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 hearing that and living it that is part of what makes mythical stories so powerful that they actually help us not be a critical consumer but become a completely irrational lover or believer um, a way a, a brand that has done this in a very funny humorous in their very very own manner um has used is, is actually brewdog which probably most everybody um of here is is uh, familiar with um we're not going to show you again the whole video because it's too long but it gives you an idea how you can also do this in a very humorous irreverent way which is typical for the whole communication Scandinavia, find a holy moose and save him from bland industrial beer. Only then will you succeed with your crowdfunded beer revolution. It's a moose head, mate. The holy moose has beckoned us. We've got to go to Scandinavia. And we've got to go now. Okay, and on it goes, telling you about their fight with the bland industrial beer Vikings, of course, that they encounter in Scandinavia and how they're going to ultimately succeed to save the world from bad beer to something better. Um, I think you can imagine the story. <clears throat> this here talks, you see how brand myth or the idea of really telling your brand story in a mythical manner has really taken on. Uh, Lego done it, has done it very intentionally and very involved, um, putting out movies even that people were willing to pay for. Um, on the other hand, um, there's been the recent movie that probably most of you have seen or heard of, Ford versus Ferrari, which was done without um, the involvement of Ford. Uh, actually, in general, Ford, the, the myth that was that is still lurking in the story that is told in this movie, Ford never really um, capitalized on. Ford never really found a way to to own anything, uh, arguably, and which is uh, also one of the reasons why they're probably in trouble. And even now, when they had the opportunity to get involved and, and leverage this in telling their brand story, they um, didn't do it again. One, th there's two basic ways how you can uh, build myth. I mean, there's generally four, according to Campbell, there's four different dimensions of myth but the two that we, we've seen mostly used in um, marketing and in brand building is uh, the first one, myth to reach beyond. That's basically connecting your brand with something that is more powerful um, than yourself. Something that's almost has supernatural powers, as you can see in the following example, which is, um, well, actually, I don't tell you what it is. You, 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 can, you can guess um, uh, for a while. So I stop it again here. Um, 
This is, is a video about Kristallwelten, which is um, a brand experience center, you might call it. For those of you who have never heard of it, it's from the company Swarovski, which probably most of you know, um, Crystal Makers, the most world's most famous crystal um, maker uh, from Wattens near Innsbruck in Austria. And they've built there a cave um, into the actual mountain where they showcase with the help of different artists, the potential and the power of crystal. And of course, at the same time, in, uh, evoke the feeling without saying it because they could never say that, that glass crystal, which is what they're making, has some resemblance or connection to a mountain crystal, which is actually formed by the pressure of the earth. Of course, the two have nothing to do with each other, but by putting themselves into the cave in the mountain and, and doing this very, very uh, super transcendental um, experience, they, um, they, they kind of say it without saying it. All right. So there is the myth that makes us, make us believe that reach beyond uh, like Wolfgang uh, was talking about, other brands feel more comfortable with a myth that is more of a guiding myth. So if you look at the next slide, we'll have some typical examples there, like for example, um, you know, Johnny Walker that you probably all know well, we just looked at Just Do It. So these are almost, you know, calls to action. Johnny Walker, a mythical figure that they actually build up after the ad campaign, when they saw people being so eager to then find out more about this mythical uh, figure of Johnny Walker and literally started to build his house and build his legend and then build clubs to bring the myth to life. But you also find it in CPG with always, for example, doing a very nice job with, you know, um, the like a girl, you know, girls and empowering girls and the power of girls showing through. And everyone knows, of course, Elon Musk, which is almost a representation of his Tesla brand and this myth that he builds up about, you know, this forward looking modern world that pushes us forward, pushes us literally on Mars and already thinks and, of course, dreams about that world over there. Now, all of that is very good and you should do it, but there's one important thing, which is don't let the side that everyone, uh, that everyone always fears about actually catch you, which is, oh, at the end, it's just stories. You know, it's just made up stuff. You cannot be cheating at that. Just like with the mission, you need to truly put your action, your storytelling, your doing where your mouth is. Let me show you another example, a uh, little uh, video, this one you will see from ExxonMobil. Plants capture CO2. What if other kinds of plants captured it too? If these industrial plants had technology that captured carbon like trees, we could help lower emissions. Carbon capture is important technology and experts agree. That's why we're working on ways to improve it. So plants can be a little more like plants. So there you go. And in class discussions, you know, I would ask students and they would tell me, oh, ExxonMobil is very active in carbon capture. It is trying to change its image. It's engaging in green technologies. It's trying to make plants green. And yes, you got the message. But then next slide, you go on the internet and you look up a little bit, what's the investment actually in carbon capture systems by the oil industry compared to what they still spend on fossil fuels and exploration and all the quote unquote dirty stuff and you're taken aback. Exactly 0.8% in 2019 the year that this video was broadly shown by ExxonMobil. And that's where the trouble starts. Next slide. Because then, of course, people ask uh, founded questions. They say, hey, what's going on here? Uh, even as a total industry, you spend less than 1% against what seems in your advertising to be your main activity. What happens next? 
very embarrassed. You see it here. The comments are being turned off because those are, you know, uncomfortable comments for this industry. And it goes on for a while and a while. And then in the next slide, you have media coming out saying, look, guys, I looked into this. I can no longer support your bullshit advertisement because there are outright lies. So this is how a mission, a declared mission, an advertised mission, a celebrated mission actually totally backfires because clearly your organization, your beliefs and your actions and your money are not where your mouth is. This all particularly holds true <clears throat> if you take on sociopolitical, meaningful um, ideas or values uh, or goals, uh, as in the case of ExxonMobil. Um, but it also holds when you are just doing something like Airbnb did or other brands where it's more about improving an experience or doing something yourself. Your brand must be lived inside out. There's a higher need for truth and for honesty and for transparency these days than there ever used to be, and particularly for Uber brands, which gets us to point two of the three phases, which is do, which is really not a phase because it actually, it, it goes on from the beginning until after you died. You must realize and live your dream inside out. Mini is a good example here because they have a very, very clear understanding of themselves. And by the way, another example that does not capture um, a, a societal value or an ecological uh, mindset, but really just talks about the love um, that the car can or, or traditionally uh, inspire in people and, and the fun that comes with it. Um, that little um, David against Goliath kind of feel. And a great um, example of myth making as well. And, and exactly, exactly. Um, and so here you see like the, the overview. Uh, but but um, it's all about really building your own world. And if it, that needs substance, yes, but it also needs a certain style. Right, which gets us to this example, which is close to your homes. <clears throat> i.e. you all guessed it, right? You see this picture or the next one and you say, of course, this is Dyson. And there is no reason why a vacuum cleaner would have to look like that or be built like that. This is a true expression through the product of what you are, of John Dyson believing in the beauty of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and as we know, looking down rather on software engineering and others and furthering that and celebrating it that and telling every time his stories around the 10,000 prototypes plus it took him to get to this machine and making the bag where the vortex sucks up all the dust transparent. So where others hide it, you celebrate the beautiful efficacy of this machine. So this is truly expression doing of what you believe in. And it translates also to the headquarters and to the organization and where you eat and what you eat, obviously in some brands and what it looks like where you are and where your investment is. And in the case of Dyson, it's all about celebrating technology, about celebrating research, R&D, et cetera, as uh, this little video will show you as well. And again, here we talk about prototypes, uh, just even in the header. Most of our products will start with a problem or a frustration, and that's all done in our new product innovations team. So. Dyson 9, which is part of our campus expansion, is where all of our NPI and our research teams are focused. They'll start by working out what the problem is. They'll go through as many different ways as they could think of of solving that problem. And they'll develop them to a point where they think, yeah, this, this concept looks good. I think we can do something with this concept. On something new, like Supersonic, it can take up to four years. You've probably seen a lot of the um, prototypes we did of Supersonic. So we, we went through- Okay, we can pause it here. But no, go back, but just pause it. But you can see at the end of the day, we're just, we're just talking about a hairdryer, okay? We're talking about a hairdryer 
And so all of this manifestation, and you think you're at the, you know, the Pentagon here, and there's uh, literally, there are jets at uh, Dyson, um, all the celebration and this expression of technology. Now we go to the store, okay? And the same is true there. You have the celebrate, you go inside and you think, next slide, it is a technology museum where again, the technology is put on the pedestal. There is no cleaning going on. There's no hair drying going on. You think this is a, a jet here, but what you see on the left is actually their hair dryer. And you go to the back of the store, next slide, and you see the myth making and the storytelling happening at the top where again, they talk to you about all the prototypes. And at the bottom is another technique we talk about a lot, which is to make it yours. I.e. here's the customization center where you decide which color combinations you want, whether it's your blow dryer or it is your vacuum cleaner. Again, bring yourself back to earth. We're talking about vacuum cleaners and hair dryers but truly it is a celebration of the wonders of technology. Another example <clears throat> from a very, very different world, literally a very different world, but also a completely different category is Brunello Cuccinelli. I don't know how many of you are aware of the brand, but it's been, ta it's taken the, um, for in the last 20 years or so, it's really uh, revolutionized cashmere and, and taking on a leading role. Uh, in a world, well, it has helped, of course, that cashmere generally has been democratized and, and gone further, but Brunello Cuccinelli really was on the spearhead. And here you'll see something that's really taken the idea of building your own world um, to the extreme. Um, you see this little, um, this little um, uh, village there, which is in Umbria, outside of Perugia. Um, it's called Solomeo, and um, it's where they built their headquarter. Actually, they didn't build their headquarter. They bought the entire village um, and turned it into, into um, their own, the Bonello Cuccinelli village. Um, here you see it in, in another way. They even went to, to the extreme uh, in renovating everything. They also, I don't know what's with this presentation. It's, it's jumping back and forth. But um, there's a um, there's there's a theater. There used to be a theater there, which of course was was um, neglected and, and not not really functioning anymore. And they renovated it and brought actually the the whole the whole village to life. And now use it for conferences, for meetings, but also for entertaining their staff because that his whole idea. And that's why you have always like here on this slide panel, you always have philosophical statements. Um, sometimes written in stone, literally, uh, in the village, but also in every in every store, in every communication. He was a philosophy student at one point, and he combines uh, an ethical approach to life um, with a commercial one. Um, and uh, although it's on the on the on the superficial level, it's all about high, super high end cashmere and expensive sweaters. It is actually underpinning, uh, uh, under it lies a real, a, a value driven approach to life, which thinks a lot, but also means treating your, um, your staff well, producing in a manner that's humanistic and, and not exploitative. Here, for instance, you'll also see a, um, one of the, the staff rooms, so to speak, but also used as a, as a conference room, so meeting rooms. And then it also translates into the outside world, where even the outside of their their, their flagship stores, they try to find something that expresses their idea of architecture that serves a purpose and has a sense of beauty that they want to stand for. Underneath you see then how inside, and that's of course a given most brands do that, how inside you try to replicate in this case, Solomeo, the, the little village in Umbria, and, and the inside of a well-cultured being with books and blah, 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 and pictures. Um, around in, in amidst your um, arguably high priced, at least, let's say, um, sweaters. And then in the communication, time for spirit, time for harmony, that's their Christmas ad, uh, a perennial Christmas ad, stop jumping ahead. Um, the, the time for spirit and time for harmony, that's their way of communicating. No product, actually never, hardly ever a product in their communication. It's always about an attitude um, that elevates those sweaters much more than the quality alone could. 
and here it, it, they, they take it even to an extreme where they um, this is from an this is a design pad of your credit card from an outlet store which of course they are which is un somewhat un uber brandish that they that they actually do sell to outlet stores but at least they are even they um they make sure that you get reminded of the origin of it all it, which is the skyline of Solomio. so the whole point is you really have to be it don't just execute it you have to live your idea and an ideal if it if, if it is inside out with everything that you do all the time because a dream is hard to build but it's very very quickly destroyed if you found to be faking it all right we're getting to the last phase here which is after the dreaming and the doing there needs to be a bit of spice here, and that's the daring part, how you deal with your targets and your communication if you want to bring it into marketing speak. And there are two concepts here that are of interest. The first one, next slide, is um, the difference, next slide, between what we call the uber target, okay, the above and beyond target, the ideal, and the strategic target, which are all the people who might possibly buy you, okay? Those people that you do in the target segmentation, et cetera, et cetera. I'll show you how that works in a second. The second um, concept, uh, well, okay, uh, the slides are a bit different here. The, another concept that is important and that shows uh, how the tension is being created is the psychological concept of the different states of self. We all know our current real self. We have a feeling for that. There might be a worry state self, but we all have some aspirations. We all have an ideal self, maybe even a fantasy self out there that we dream about literally, or sometimes we daydream about. The Instagram and the internet and social media are actually a perfect expression of that because I don't know if you noticed, but most of Instagram, Pinterest, et cetera, posts have to do with your dream world and you artificially created in beautiful settings just for that one pick rather than truly your everyday life, even though it's supposed to appear as if it was just a fleeting moment in what you do every day. The second concept, now we're getting to it, that I was talking about is the velvet rope principle that we talk about in our book. And the velvet rope is simply about playing between being the insider physically or also in knowledge and the outsider. And Studio 54 that you see here in New York is a great example where for the short time it existed, you know, people tried like crazy to get in because that's where the party was. That's where the celebrities by Andy Warhol and, 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 and Michael Jackson and so on were and had the craziest parties and drugs and fun and horses and God knows what but you had to get through the velvet rope, which is in this case, the bouncer at the door. And the bouncer at the door to top it all was even more extreme in just letting certain people in, not everyone. And that made it even more of an appeal. So that brings me to the Uber target. And I said that, you know, I could explain this very quickly. If you look at this picture and I ask you to imagine who this person is, and I do this often in class, you will say, of course, it's a guy, it's a smoker, he's got a beard, yes, he's got a gun, yes, tattoos, leather, favorite color is black. We all have an image of that person. And in case you missed it, the company would show you, next slide, what that kind of person is. Our own way. We believe in going our own way no matter which way the rest of the world is going. We believe in bucking the system that's built to smash individuals like bugs on a windshield. Okay, we can stop it Someone here. So you get the language, you get the language, you get the attitude, you get it all. But when you compare this Uber target, this dream target, this hell's angel to the actual buyer, you realize the big discrepancy because the actual buyer like these guys, stereotypical, they are dentists, you know, they are stock traders, 
yeah, there are some of them are contractors and mechanics and plumbers. What they have in common is they all have a midlife crisis and they would love to be that hell's angel, even if it's just for a weekend. And that's what we understand by the Uber target, the dream out there, the ideal self, and you trying to get there and the tension that that creates. So you're really a part of it. You're part of the hogs, the Harley ownership club, but you're always a bit apart because you're not quite the hell's angel either. Yeah, how this how this system or this double need to make people be belong to something or make people feel like belong, they belong to a club or to an idea, but then there's enough people also still longing to do that. Um, Rafa shows in a very good way. I think most of you perhaps have heard about the brand, have seen it. It's it's put itself almost at the forefront of this whole biking craze. Was started in two thousand four by Simon Mottram, and actually the whole name Rafa. It's all about it. It, it comes from the sixties, from from a very mysterious kind of like group of road cyclists and and actually a team at the at the um, at the Tour de France. Um, but the point is that he was driven by this idea of gentlemen cyclers um, that have a certain style and a certain grace and they help each other, they help others that kind of don't come along. It's not a competitive kind of like killing each other, but it has something to do with uh, um, an approach that's very f full of respect. And um, that's what he built this whole brand around with, with stylish or more stylized functional gear um, uh, taken on also the aesthetics of the 60s. At the core, at the Uber target, you have what's often also called as the Rafia, the um, Rafia Cycling Club members that are actually living up to this ideal of a gentleman. <clears throat> uh, and they actually do things that are very gentlemanly like, like for instance, the gentleman's race in 2014 in Bavaria, which um, was really running around that motto. Um, but the, the point is that they are accessible. You can become a member of the club, but not everybody can and not all the time. The, because around that is a tier which is nowadays known as mammals. Those are actually the hardcore fans that are buying into the whole philosophy and idea of Rafa, but they aren't yet part of the inner circle of the Rafia or of the club. Here's a, just a quick video um, there was this term to show you what those mammals are like. Lytra. We thought that was a great acronym to use, mammal. Road cyclist with all the gear and no idea. Well, I've got 11 bikes in total. <laughs> 13 bikes. Bikes worth probably about three and a half thousand dollars all up. Six and a half. Flagra. It makes you pour your body into something which is going to show every lump and bump. It's just embarrassing in public. No, we look bloody stupid and we're just weekend warriors trying to set our own best times and challenging each other. Um, so that's that's the reality. That's the reality of those that are really willing to spend. They want to live up to an idea, but they know themselves that they're not 100 percent there yet um, or never, perhaps never will be. But it's still nicer to live that dream. And then on the outside of that world, on the third tier level, is then the wider strategic target of everybody who owns a bike and goes biking occasionally and needs to have gear for that. Um, but but really, it's it's this interesting tiering that you have different hierarchies of access to the brand, just like um, uh, it always was with any kind of cult or club um, at the forefront of, of course, the church or every kind of religion, of course. Um, it is, and, and that, as we said, going into the chapter, um, it's all about style and substance, building a world that people want to belong to and that allows them to set themselves apart requires that you have truth and substance, but it also requires that you find a very unique style. Uh, okay, ready? Ah, now. Stop. Ah. JP? All right, I'm gonna just do one more slide because I wanna have at least 30 seconds for questions. And that is the breakfast slide from Heinz, which in conclusion, um, obviously many of the brands we showed you, they master dream do there. But what's interesting is that even the very state staple mass brand and in a time of crisis can actually find 
kind of a higher purpose can find their way to going a little, a little above and beyond going towards Uber brands. And the question obviously will be how they continue their actions. And the example here is Heinz, again, close to your hearts. I know the breakfast beans, which during the COVID crisis, when people realized not only in the UK, but also in the US that a lot of poor children depended actually on those breakfasts and lunches for their nutrition. That's how poor and polarized society is by now. Um, boosted this initiative that they had already going in, but much increased this initiative of providing free breakfast um, and free lunches in the US to the population. So what a wonderful way to make people feel that Heinz and its foods are not just, you know, the kind of industrial foods that are there for every day. And if you want to have something special, you do everything but that but remind us that they're actually quite essential and to a lot of people, the very important nutrition that they have. So a very nice way to elevate. And the proof of the pudding now for many of these brands attempting to step up will be, will they continue it? Will they find ways to make this come to life continuously or will they fall back into the mass marketing uh, kind of habit of just making it campaign? and it's going to be gone by the time COVID is gone. Um, so here you go, Dream Do Dare, um, two books on that, if you have that last slide. And if I understand right, we should have about two more minutes. No, no, we have until a quarter past. We have until a quarter past. Oh, wonderful, okay. So I don't know why you're thinking minutes, only two minutes. 15 minutes for questions, and um, I, I think, uh, yeah, Katarina, you also want to share the poll results, right? Yes, thank you very much for such an insightful talk uh, to JP and Wolf. We seriously enjoyed all the insights that you shared and the examples and the connections you made between the concepts that you brought from philosophy and sociology and so many other disciplinary backgrounds into understanding the business and the marketing world in a different way. Um, Emma will be able to share the poll results in a second. Um, I would like to pick up on the idea of the Q&A uh, generated discussion that we had started throughout the talk. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the Q&A, but I was thinking of um, moderating, moderating the Q&A by picking up uh, some of the questions we have. Oh, right. I can see the results. Can you see the results as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yes. Wonderful. So wow. I, I think a couple of things there, which, which is interesting because we've <clears throat> done this polling a couple of times and over the last two crisis waves, the understanding of prestige and luxury and premium has gone away totally from exclusive, expensive, precious materials, which used to be the quintessential ingredients. In fact, if you look at the classic textbooks, like the luxury strategy, that's what it says. Be precious, have provenance, um, be exclusive. And it's interesting how things like artfully designed, innovative, and also having a mission come to the fore. Or sustainability specifically, as uh, which is often, of course, lauded yes. as new kind of quality and relationships and community, which is again, the social aspect. So this poll very much in line with what we typically get, which is actually the almost the anti-definition of luxury, but also bears the risk of what we talked about, every mass marketer looking at such um, poll results and saying, oh my God, I need to somehow link my soft drink or my gasoline or petrol, as you say, with innovation and sustainability, right? And that's where that doesn't work. Thank you for, for this insightful analysis. I would like to ask if we maybe can discuss a question by Louise, who I think um, posed a question that ties in well with this discussion. And the question is, do you have any examples of brands in the premium space who are responding well to the challenges of climate change and the impact this will or should have on consumption? She says, I agree that it's risky for brands to just bolt on sustainability, but I'm wondering if any brands in this space are really walking the talk. 
Right. Excellent um, question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, like Patagonia um, being 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 the prime example here that that we quoted, and uh, they 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 created a whole new look at the outdoor gear world um, to the point that now every outdoor a brand is is has been forced luckily has been forced to really be much think much more about the sustainability of their production as well as the reuse or the the their products per se um so they really have been instrumental here in making a change particularly in an industry that is concerned with with um admiring and and experiencing nature while but was very often um uh, adding to it, destroying it as well um, but then there's others. I mean, basically, I mean, every brand these days or every company from LVMH to Caring to God knows whom, all the luxury makers, MS, they start understanding that sustain sustainability is key. A lot of them argue oftentimes, if you, if you come to the luxury um, field, that by producing things in a handcrafted manner, locally mostly produced versus in China and shipped around the world and lasting long, if not a lifetime, um, that's already an approach to sustainability because you're producing less but better versus more and cheaper. <clears throat> but it, on, on top of that, of course, in the, particularly in the fashion world, um, they, they are finding a way to counteract fast fashion and everything that's come with it. And uh, you see that on every brand, on every company level. But fortunately, not all of them taking it and making it a sales point, but they're doing it in the background and they're working on finding ways to be more innovative and producing in manners that are less exploitative. Well, I mean, this this is very topical. I literally I came late by a couple of minutes because I was just coming out of giving a presentation on brand elevation and re-commerce. And re-commerce obviously is one of the key tools now through the real real and through uh, ThreadUp and, and, and other providers, as well as infrastructures that brands build themselves. And like Wolfgang says, you know, you've got any, everything from brands that rich, literally are building themselves around it, like Patagonia or Eileen Fisher or Stella McCartney, uh, et cetera, to brands that just expand and even make it, if, if you think about daring, um, Gucci currently is all about vintage and 70s and everything. And they tied their collaboration uh, with uh, the real real and with other uh, re-commerce uh, platforms around bringing vintage Gucci items back. So there are, there are various techniques and strategies among all the uh, a dream do and daring that you can do in order to lower your carbon footprint and to be strategic about it. Thank you. We have a range of interesting questions coming in. And I would like to build on this conversation you started uh, by picking a question from Emily, who asks, um, you know, do you think it is even possible for profit driven companies to stick to ethical values when they conflict with financial goals? And can we maintain our integrity in a capitalist system? And I guess this was also relating to something I was really thinking about while you were talking about the myths, that there are potentially also anti myths that are not exactly, let's say, helpful to some companies, because there's this myth possibly of corporate hegemony. Um, that especially the big corporations such as PNG, Axon Mobile have to overcome um, in order to gain consumer trust and build some sort of credibility and buy-in. Um, yes, yeah, so I think the question is, uh, can we actually maintain integrity in a capitalist system? Right. I, it, it, I it mean, is a, oh, JP, do you want to go? Go. Um, so, of course, it's a challenge and there are very different approaches to it. Um, uh, we did the podcast this morning with Lego and Lego Foundation, okay? And their way of doing that is by literally having the Lego Foundation own 20% of Lego, but being completely independent and being able to dedicate itself purely to the mission of the company, which is to elevate play, um, to, to help children develop, okay, into healthy human beings. So there is this possibility of separating and forcing yourselves through laws and norms to fulfill your mission 
and you've got that in Lego, in Hershey, in Ben and Jerry's, uh, uh, as well as the whole B Corporation movement that looks to create statues to force yourself there. And then there are, and, and it's true that it's easier for private companies, privately owned companies. They are simply the companies that build up their statues and have the owners that are willing to invest in that, like uh, uh, Patagonia or, or, or REI, which is a mutually owned company, or Vanguard Investments, which is mutually owned. Oh, so God. here the statutes uh, help that. But uh, for the PNGs of this world, yes, it's a very, um, it's a balancing act and it's a difficult progress, but I think societal pressures, if they exist, will get everyone there. Well, and, and I mean, they, they, they're, it, it, there's no other choice, you know. Yes, it is difficult, but we don't have much of a choice. And, and that's why um, it, Paul Pullman, um, uh, CEO of Unilever, and, uh, and at that time, owner or owner of Ben and & Jerry's, in the meantime, he has left the company, but they started the B team together with, with Branson and uh, other leaders from the industry to really think along the lines, how can we integrate the three pillars, profit, planet, uh, people, how can we integrate them and not have profit as one against planet and people, but have actually profit above at, at, to the power of three, which is actually product, planet, people. And that from all three streams, you want to profit, just not always in a monetary manner. Um, so there's ways that, that there's lots of people thinking about how can we actually move to more of, of what's generally called a stakeholder capitalism. Uh, but of course, it's still we're still ways to go. Thank you. I'm aware of the time and also that we have quite a few questions. So I was thinking I will progress by the way the questions were upvoted to make sure that the people who had most interest in those um, will receive the answer. So I would like to ask the question posed by Jess, who said, what do you think is the most important aspect of brand image? I what think, is the most important? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, th this is a dangerous question in terms of how you think about brand. There is no one most important part or aspect, i.e., is it the storytelling? Is it the corporate identity? Is it your beliefs? Is it what you do? Is it at retail? Is it at product? Our point the whole time is it all needs to fit together consistently and needs to fit under this kind of meta myth of what you're all about and what you are. Importantly, as, as Wolfgang repeated several times, it doesn't have to be about you know, the social revolution or uh, saving the world or the environment. It can just be about being a better cup of coffee, Starbucks, uh, you know, or uh, other more humble things, reinventing a category, Nespresso. Um, but you need to be consistent, you need to act on it, you need to put your money and your, your action where your mouth is, etc. And exactly not just keep it at one aspect of, I'm going to focus on doing great PR, or I'm going to have a beautifully uh, uh, branded and designed and styled, you know, product, that's not going to be enough. Thank you. And I think this really feeds into the question by Josie, who had pointed out that we know of some brands, obviously, that uh, sometimes pick up on certain trends for their, some people call cause marketing, but they only do so for as long as it is trendy. So specifically, her question is, do you believe that brands take into account the fact that it could have on their revenue and popularity within the market when they're talking the talk, but not necessarily walking the walk? or walking the walk for no longer than it is a trend. Perhaps, for example, those brands during Pride Month or brands who promoted Black Lives Matter, but only during July 2020. Yeah, they use it as a, as a marketing tool, just like many look at brands still, that they're marketing instruments. And in, the, in, the, in, in marketing, I can do nice diversity messages or ecological messages or whatever it is that fits the moment and fits the trend, as you say. Uh, or even if I do it for longer, it's it's actually often well meant. You know, they want to support um, uh, gay inclusivity or or inclusivity on a broader level. You know, or or whatever it is. But um, 
but it is still not lived and that's the problem so if if you just and that that, that actually goes back to the question of what is important about the image what's important about the image is that it isn't just an image that there is substance behind the image and that holds true for any kind of communication also for communication that's actually well meant and serving a higher purpose but if you don't live that purpose with your entire brand or company it doesn't make any sense in the long run Oh, on the and other side, you anyway. but particularly mass marketers are often scared saying, I don't want to engage in that. Even if I believe in it, I don't want to engage in it because not everyone might be of the same opinion and I want to be a popular brand. That also is misguided. So for example, many said, oh my God, Nike is getting into, you know, Copernic and helping him stand his ground and Indeed, people were burning Nike shoes on the internet and et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that Nike is very aware of what we call the Uber target and of its segment of followers. And the few people who burned cheap Nike shoes uh, uh, in the countryside, I'm stereotyping to make a point here, they don't make up for the um, increased passion that you get from your brand fans. And remember, most brands don't have a, a share of 30, 40, 50, 60% anymore. In fact, they have low single digits. So there is less to lose by being yourself than you would think. Thank you. As I is think in life in general. <laughs> I, I think this is really um, tying in well with this uh, question of how many narratives should a brand pursue? Are there, there, or how many narratives are too many narratives for a brand? Well, so yeah, we, we didn't we didn't really get to that because we cut already back because we were thinking it, it was getting too long. And then all of a sudden when when JP had exit panic, we dropped that. But there's there is the idea that what we call the myth is is the meta narrative is actually an overarching brand story because a lot of people have adopted a lot of companies have adopted storytelling as part of their communication but then they're telling a lots of stories that are conflicting or diverging versus stories that can be many but all lettering up to an overarching story the meta story the myth and that's that's the importance of having that myth that you bundle that you I you know what story what main story shall every little story that I'm going to tell with every initiative or every new product or with amongst every target what shall that ladder up to and how so that it's all if not consistent all the time but at least congruent Thank you. I think, yes, uh, congruence and probably the alignment of the narratives that are uh, constructed with the overall myth is the is the art. I yeah. guess it is an art and a science, but yeah, uh, it's a it very is. interesting insight. Yeah. Um, there is a, um, a question from uh, from yeah. Jess on rebranding. And I yeah. guess this is uh, quite interesting with regards to um, whether brands can or should um, rebrand using maybe a different myth or turning around their their current position so specifically her question is do you think that rebranding a business that already has a strong brand image is always a, is a bad idea i guess the question could be framed is it a good or bad idea it depends <laughs> but right uh, again um the question is interesting because you should do a rebrand for a reason right so it's, it shouldn't be just an idea i.e new brand manager new marketing director coming and say let's do something new which actually often happens i saw somebody uh, one of the participants rebranded themselves uh, uh in their name and it's called brand elevation thanks for that that's a great rebrand but um to come back to this here Brands should always evolve. We talk about that in the book. You can never stand still. So while you have a firm mission and you're very consistent, and you're going along with that, you need to evolve with your organization, with society, with the brand. Like a person, you will find new insights. You, your beliefs might shift, but it needs to be for a good reason. And it needs to be consistent with who you are. You cannot jump from being one thing one day to another so you know uh, 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 rebranding just because it seems a good idea it is never a good idea and certainly not to cover up your past 
So um, because there's often rebranding attempts that are trying to wipe out what has happened, what seems unsightly at the moment, and you want to move into a new world, that doesn't work anyway. Um, you have to live up to, you have to fess up to your your past and try to find a way to then evolve it, as, as JP was saying. Right. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm aware of the time. I would like to ask one last uh, question that I actually picked from a bit of the bottom of the, of the q and I guess it was maybe asked later, so it did not get as many upvotes, but given some of the examples that you mentioned, I felt it lines up really well. And this is on the role of founders and strong personalities and businesses um, that get a lot of focus potentially and also around which the actual brand is built. Um, so the question comes from Keith who asks, um, how important do brands like BrewDog or Tesla, um, do you think the founders and leaders are and where do these brands go if and when these founders or leaders exit? Could that be the biggest PR disaster for those fans who have followed the growth trajectory and are the early yeah. adopters? Or can brands separate successfully from these personalities? JP, do you want to go or shall I? Right. right. I mean, that that is, I think that, yeah, I think that is a, is a, a, a danger, particularly with the fast turnover startup to become unicorn uh, economy that we're having, i.e. brands and companies being founded and even before they exist already with the objective of being sold as quickly as possible for as much money as possible. There, it is tough to build it up on founders um, and then flip it over and somehow pretend uh, that it still works, etc. cetera. Um, where it works is when the founder, when the founding figure is more important because of the lasting beliefs that is shared by the organization being imbued, et cetera, and that being lived on, like you have it in a Chouinard and Patagonia, for example, okay? Or that you, you, you have it, you know, in a Brunello uh, Cuccinelli. Uh, sometimes these people are very prominent and in the media, et cetera, Sometimes you literally feel and see them just through their beliefs, how they are being expressed. But as long as they stick with it, as long as Elon Musk, you know, isn't just there to flip Tesla, which he doesn't seem to be, you know, <clears throat> Tesla is him and the brand are one to a very large extent. And yes, I mean, the craziness that he is, is part of the brand. It's, you know, hopefully it's not going to PR being PR managed away somehow. Sometimes actually it's even advantageous if your um, founder or leading figure personification of your brand dies or exits in some other way <laughs> early because um, that person in the proverbial sense are not necessarily literally dead. Um, are much easier to manage, you know, they, they cannot go wrong, they cannot cause a scandal of me too proportions or whatever, um, and, and wipe out everything that you've done over years and years and build up in, in, in trust and belief. So um, holding on to the idea of a person sometimes is easier than than having to deal with the real one, actually. Thank you so much to both Wolf Schaefer and JP Kuhlwein for this session and for extending your time into a Q&A session that allowed us to take care of so many questions. I would like to thank also everyone in our audience tonight from the alumni, the prospective students, the current students who joined us. I hope that you find um, these insights as exciting as I am. <laughs> and of course, I would like to also just direct you what you can see on the slide to the resources that um, JP and Wolf have, have shared. I'm sure that some of the questions you were not able to address due to the scope of the session's timing um, can be addressed through the content that is available online and also in the book. I think this is is maybe a very good gift to ourselves for the summer for the remaining times of um, weeks maybe of COVID lockdown in several countries. Um, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to the session and concluded on um, just a big thank you to, for, to JP and Wolf for joining us at Lancaster virtually and with very much insight. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely was. Bye. Goodbye, Bye. everybody. Goodbye, Goodbye everyone. everyone.